A gentle warning that some of the content in today's episode may raise issues for those who have experienced trauma. If today's episode does raise any concerns for you, please reach out to your local mental health service and for those in Australia, contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Welcome to Mind and Soul Matters, I'm Farah Feeney. Through conversations with everyday people, Mind and Soul Matters aims to broaden our understanding of mental health and spirituality, and to deepen our insights into the challenges and meaning of our lives. Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor said, Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing your freedom to choose how you will respond. We all have that power, the power to choose how we respond in a situation. This is something that is within our control. Andrew, a youth mental health worker at Headspace, sees this every day in his work and he has seen it in his life. Andrew has lived a life of challenges and trauma and along the way he's had to make choices. How has his life experiences and traumas shaped who he is today? How does a person live through trauma and make choices that lead to healing and giving back to others with compassion, empathy and love? Welcome, Andrew. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Farah. Let's start with you painting us a picture of your childhood and adolescence. What was it like for you growing up? If I can go right back to like as early as I can remember, I grew up in Midland. I grew up on a chicken farm in Midland. It was, yeah, quite an interesting experience. Like, gosh, I remember when I was very young, like my little Ugg boots on, like running around, like with the chickens and running around, like in piles of manure and things like that. And that was like my idea of fun, I suppose. Mm-hmm. My family had ran a business, an egg business there. And I used to remember like playing football with all of the uh, workers and stuff. Like I'd have like a little football and I, cause there were like two houses on site and I used to live in one and my auntie used to live in the other and they were like a bit, yeah, a bit from each other, but we'd kind of like sometimes meet in the middle on the way to, on the way to work. My dad would go to work in the shed. My mum would also go to work in the shed sometimes. And yeah, there's like, I used to like put my little hug boots on, walk you know, down and bring the football with me and, yeah, mm. kick the footy, play off the workers. I really did have a lot of joy throughout that period of my life. I remember, oh, gosh, it was, I think that's where the real, and I, at the time I didn't know it, the real emphasis of, I think, who I am as a person kind of developed in, in like, in touch with my own culture. Mm-hmm. I remember, you know, family would always, when it was birthdays, whether it was christening, whether it was anything to do with, and my brother, because I have a brother as well, whether, you know, we, we would have any kind of milestones, our whole family would rock up. Mm. And by whole family, I don't just mean like, you know, cousins and, you know, my grandparents. It would be cousins, second cousins, everyone, like anyone and everyone you could imagine. There was like not enough space in the backyard for them wow. pretty much. <laughs> sounds amazing. It sounds like an amazing childhood. The picture I'm getting yeah. is, is fun. It's with nature, it's joyful, it's big family. Yeah, it was definitely like that. And there was lots of, like, laughter, lots of food, lots of culture. Like, you know, being like being Italian, like, there was just, like, this massive emphasis on everyone had to eat, everyone had to do yeah. stuff. Like, even things such as, like, you know, like, we'd make the tomato sauce. Like, I'd have the whole family over for that. And it was such a, like, a momentous occasion. We'd remember cut the tomatoes the, the, the nights before and we'd have them in the garage laid out on paper and then we'd put them in. We had this big 44-gallon drum. I have no idea where my parents got it from, but we had this big 44-gallon drum with the top cut off of it. And we would, like, put the tomatoes in there and salt them, like, layer Mm -hmm. by layer by layer by layer. And then in the morning, I'd probably, I remember I'd always end up sleeping in the morning off because mm-hmm. it was, it's, to me, it was almost better than Christmas. Like I'd wake up and you could just smell the tomatoes cooking. But my parents, was, they'd take their 45 gallon drum, like my grandfather used to be there, or my nonno, he used to be there and he used to like help them with, move the 45 gallon drum onto this big burner. Mm-hmm. It's like this like big paler style burner, which they'd use to heat up. Mm-hmm. And I'd be out there with like a, literally a broomstick handle stirring the thing and then letting it cook and then when they they would always like I don't know it's like the experience of doing it for so long they'd always know when it was ready Mm. and then you'd 
get the ladle and you'd pass the tomatoes and then you'd have like people like scooping you'd have people using the machine because it was all done we didn't have an electric machine it's all done by hand yeah yeah so we had this like really small like little tomato press and we used to ladle the tomatoes into that someone would be turning the machine two people would be filling up the tubs two people would be bottling so it was like a a process that the whole family did together and it was just so enriching and I think that yeah that was a really beautiful like I think beautiful essence for me but it was like also once I started to kind of develop an understanding of things the pro not that process but other processes in my life kind of identified that they kind of weren't as great and what I mean by that I think was I think the biggest struggle I had was when I first I'd probably say year three and I was targeted for bullying like and I was meant to feel like I was an outcast or an outlier and I think that that really made that really yeah made me feel isolated made me feel that I wasn't part of society I suppose yeah and that's a, a critical age as well so I imagine you were about nine eight nine in year three so yeah um, and that's kind of starting to develop some of your own I well, the very beginnings of that the, the social interactions and your own identity and so on like coming into the teenage years a couple of years after that so what did it then develop into and what did it look like your adolescent years I think at the end of year four I moved to a farm and my parents got out of the egg business and that was as a result of a dispute between my my family and my grandparents because they were all in partnership. That and must have been a significant life event given how important family was for you. For sure. It fractured the family mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. But at the time I kind of obviously was... I knew something was wrong, but not full. Like it wasn't obviously that I was consciously aware of it at the time. I kind of, I knew something wasn't right, but something didn't, like what didn't add up kind of didn't, I didn't make sense of what kind of didn't add up for me. Definitely got a lot more isolated because I've moved from an egg farm onto a, a fruit farm out in Serpentine. And I was kind of out there, just me, my family, the big family outings they became less frequent Mm -hmm. my grandparents and my my parents kind of had had a bit of a disagreement they tried to make amends with it over time but at that point their like relationship was fractured what was school like at that time equally shit Mm. yeah equally shit did Um, racism come into it at all growing up definitely some of the bullying i got was racially motivated for sure I remember a young person coming up to me when I was young saying to me, oh, your mum's a slut because she's Italian. Italians are all sluts. They sleep around kind of thing. And, I, yeah, I remember that very significantly. Was there anything else going on in your later teens, adolescence? I think one of the things that definitely I struggled with was things in the home as well definitely became not okay. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is is that I think after the relationship between my family and my grandfather kind of became fractured, things were always tense. Mm-hmm. Was there violence? There was a bit of violence, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. There was definitely a bit of violence that it bled over, like definitely mm-hmm. bled over. I think frustrations between what was going on with my parents and external factors also kind of unfortunately bled in and then they started to disagree on things and then that kind of led over into this household that was kind of always at war with itself. Mm, Highly charged. Highly charged, yeah. It was definitely like you could cut the air like a knife. Mm -hmm. You could definitely cut the air like a knife. It was just I think that that environment kind of weirdly made me very emotionally aware. Like that's where I kind of developed my emotional awareness from, being like, actually, this isn't right. I know that we're not going to go into the depths of the trauma and the challenges because that may re-traumatise some of our listeners. But what you've touched on so far is this sense of isolation as a young child going into mainstream schooling, some racism, this family breakup, possibly some violence in the family because of the highly pressured situation Mm -hmm. that was got and the fractures in the relationships within the extended family. How did you navigate through all of that? Because a person can go through that and come through it with a lot of bitterness, with anger, with hatred, with violence. 
when I went to high school, it kind of changed. The, the bullying was present, but still. But I think it was more of, you know, high school banter and people just saying crap here and there, that kind of, it, it, to get on your skin, it kind of bait you. But it wasn't as, I feel like it wasn't as malicious or as targeted as it was in primary school. because, And I think part of the reason that probably was is because we, I had such a strong core friends group that was like, and I still see them to even this day now, um, 15, 16 people of, there was always this big group, we were called the nerd group, but we were all like, oh, stuff it, we're nerds together. Like, <laughs> Sounds like you found a tribe. We definitely found our tribe. I, I did. Me and, yeah, me and you my... found your tribe. That was helpful in moving you forward. Absolutely. Yeah. We definitely got through it together, but we all had our own challenges. Like we were all like, you know, we, we like this is happening for us, this is happening for us. But that was my real big, I think that was my biggest safety net in high school was that because I could always go back and rely on my friends and they were always good people. Was there anything else, do you think, any choices you made along the way that really shaped who you are today? I definitely, as a result of things going on in my life, dissociated from it, for sure. I would use avoidance to do that. Avoidance would look like video gaming. Reading books especially was extremely important for me. That would help me dissociate. I also turned to drugs, Mm -hmm. and that's something I kind of struggled with. How did things turn around? It wasn't until I kind of met my partner and we went through a few challenges ourselves that she, and she's an amazing human being, very amazing human being, was the one who kind of pushed me to say, hey, you need support around this. You can't just continue your life this way. And that really opened my eyes because it was like, without realising it, the situation had changed. My life was different, the way my life looked different later on, but I was treating the problem as as if it was the same one when it no longer existed. Well, that sounds like a trauma response. Absolutely, definitely. I think, yeah, for me, like, there was a point, obviously, where I left my parents' home and I was no longer in that. But I obviously, the repeated back pattern of behaviour was my mm-hmm. safety net, so I kind yeah. of kept going back to that repeated pattern of behaviour. But whilst knowing it was destructive for me, it was also safe for me. So I kept doing it. And then what happened? What did you do? I went to see a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, without naming names, the one I had was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. He just got it. Mm. Like he was... Oh, gosh, I just, like, from the get-go, he knew exactly, like, the way he was able to create the safe space, the way he was able to understand where things came from, the way he was able to not judge me for things that were going on, the way he was able to understand my, like, my entire dynamic, mm-hmm. whether that be, you know, my family, whether that be my relationship, whether that be what was going on that was unhealthy for me, he really broke things down and really was able to kind of put things in a perspective for me that I was able to conceptualise and understand. And that, I think, was a massive turning point for me. But it wasn't the only thing. I don't think it was the only thing for me. I think that there was that. And I also think part of me lacked purpose at, at certain points in my life. And that really, what I mean by that as well is like after high school, for me, life kind of was very challenging for me in the sense that I had no real clear direction of what I wanted to do after high school. And I think that there's such a big, well, for my family, it was a massive emphasis put on that Mm -hmm. saying, what do you want to do? Do you want to be this person? Do you want to be, you know, do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be, you know, I don't care if you're a bin guy, like just figure out what you want to do so you can go in that direction. I didn't have an answer for them. Mm -hmm. But one thing I did kind of know Unofficially, I liked to help the rates when I came to high school and I think it definitely was a very empathic for me because I, I suppose of my own childhood and everything I'd gone through, it's like I get it when you come here and you're nervous and you're shitting yourself and you don't know where class 2.1 is and, and you know, it's your first few weeks. Like I would actually, you know, be like, oh, don't worry, yeah, I'll help you. Like if you go this way, go this way. Sometimes I'd walk, you know, you race to class or I'd help them out and they'd come back and thank me for it. So naturally I feel like there was this natural like ability to kind of, guide was there I think Mm -hmm. for me and 
I think that one of the outlooks I had, because I kind of was like just, I just got employed in hospitality and was not doing too much for myself apart from working in hospitality, not to put hospitality down because I had an amazing, amazing time working in hospitality. But, but that wasn't for you. You, you needed go, to be in a helping profession anywhere. and yeah. be caring. And I guess that sounds like that was the beginning of pursuing that path, working as a youth worker and pursuing your studies in psychology. What advice would you have, Andrew, for young people, given that that is the path you're on now and you have worked with youth, given what you've been through and there have been some times in your life where you've had to make some important choices, but what advice would you give youth that might be going through some challenges, given what you've been through? If there's anything I could say to anyone is to not be ashamed to seek help. Mm. And the reason I say that, and I think that's kind of where my mind went as you were just saying about everything, I think especially from my lens, one of the probable reasons that I didn't kind of seek help I think was probably a lot to do with the fact of my gender and also a lot to do with the fact of around shame. And I think like being a man, admitting that I need help, it's just something that I would never do. Mm. And uh, I know that now I would, absolutely. But I think as well that also cultural factors for me played a massive part in that, the expectation you don't talk about things, the expectation that you need to harden up, that kind of like mentality of my, my father was like, what is this like mental health? Like mental health isn't anything, like it doesn't mm. exist kind of thing. It's not kind of listening into that. It's to kind of to, to, to see and understand that, the feelings are real, the feelings are true, and that the best thing you can do is admit that, yeah, sometimes people need a bit of guidance mm. and sometimes that guidance needs to come from outside yourself. Mm. And I think that that's probably the best thing I can probably say to any young person is that sometimes that we ne- we just need that our extra set of eyes and who has a different outlook on things and it definitely can do wonders. And not only that, it, it, it's it's safe to do it. I think that's the main thing is it's safe to do it, especially like the fact of going into, say, you know, a mental health organisation, whether that be who I work for, whether that be anyone else, the people genuinely there, I think, and ironically, I have conversations with people at work about my own journey and it's it's almost like we all kind of share a similar space in that mm. respect. Everyone who I've worked with, not just at Headspace, but throughout my entire working life, mm. who's motivated to do this kind of work does it because they are driven to because of their own life experiences. So they have understanding about, yeah. they may not know exactly what you're going through, but they can understand because of their own journey to the same path. Yeah, absolutely. And they want to be there to help. That's absolutely. what they've chosen that path. That's very, very good advice. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on to Mind and Soul Matters and sharing your story. And I really feel like your story has given, hopefully, our listeners some strategies and some hope and some tips on what they can do as well as life throws all of us some challenges. So thank you very much for joining us. Cheers. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and you've been an awesome interviewer. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you also to our listeners. You can continue to support us by sharing an episode with a friend and following Mind and Soul Matters on your preferred podcast app and on social media where you can also keep up to date with our upcoming live forums. Look out for our next forum where you can join our live YouTube channel from anywhere in the world or join us in person in Perth, Western Australia. Again, if today's episode has raised any concerns for you, please contact your local mental health service. And for our listeners in Australia, please call Lifeline on 13 11 14. Look forward to your company next time on Mind and Soul Matters. Thank you.